Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Lewandowski, and I am a Pediatric Rheumatology Fellow at Duke University Medical Center. I'm going to talk to you today about dermatomyositis. This is intended as a teaching case and should not be used for medical decision making. I will fulfill the following learning objectives over the next 10 minutes. First, I will review the criteria for diagnosing dermatomyositis. I will then go beyond the diagnostic criteria to the full spectrum of presentation for dermatomyositis. After that, I will review laboratory criteria and histopathology. Finally, I will explore the differential diagnosis for diseases which present in a similar way to dermatomyositis. Finally, I will summarize what we have learned. Here is an outline on the upcoming lecture points. We'll start with an overview of dermatomyositis. Dermatomyositis is a rare autoinflammatory myopathy. The incidence ranges from 2 to 10 new cases per million, and the prevalence range is about 50 cases per million people, differing based on the study population. It is an autoimmune disease which targets both the integumentary and musculoskeletal systems. It is called a vasculopathy rather than a true vasculitis. It has a female preponderance, with the ratio of females to males affected being about 3 to 1. It can occur both in adults and children. There is evidence that juvenile dermatomyositis behaves differently than the adult presentation of the disease. Let's begin by reviewing the classic skin findings of dermatomyositis. The first is a heliotrope rash, seen in the picture on the left. This is always described in textbooks and frequently on board exams as violaceous. This means it has a purplish-blue discoloration, although the rash can change from purple to red depending on the skin type and disease activity. It is most commonly seen on the upper eyelids, but can also surround the eyes. It can be associated with periorbital edema. A rash on the face in malar distribution is often seen in this disease as well. Gotrim's papules are soft papules which classically occur over the MCP joints, although they can present over the MCP, PIP, and DIPs of both the hands and feet. They are often mistaken for warts, though they are less verrucous and softer than the common wart. Early in the disease, Gotrim's papules may be absent, but Gotrim's sign may be present. This sign is a scaly, violaceous erythema over the extensor surfaces, usually the MCP, PIP, DIP joints of the hands and feet, and the elbows and knees. There is also a shawl sign, which is a common distribution of the rash of dermatomyositis. This is a rash which is erythematous and is present over the shoulders and back. All of the rashes of dermatomyositis are photosensitive or exacerbated by exposure to sunlight. Another feature of dermatomyositis is calcinosis, or calcium deposits underneath the skin or within the muscle. The etiology of this is currently under intense investigation but is poorly understood. It can occur independent of both flares of skin disease and muscle weakness. The calcium is deposited under the skin, sometimes in nodules and sometimes in a sheet-like distribution. The nodules can ulcerate and become superinfected. Calcinosis, especially nodules, occurs more often at the pressure points. The diagnostic criteria for dermatomyositis were developed by Bohan and Peter in 1975. The first criterion is a weakness of the proximal muscles. This is often elucidated by a history of difficulty with climbing stairs, which uses the hip flexors, difficulty rising out of a chair, difficulty brushing hair, which uses deltoid and rotator cuff muscles, or difficulty lifting objects. Muscle weakness is documented through strength testing, focusing on the proximal muscles, which are usually weak. In many cases, the distal muscle strength is preserved. You can test peripheral strength by asking the patient to lift arms and legs against gravity and examine her resistance. Central strength can be assessed by a head raise or a sit-up. Dermatomyositis is also characterized by elevated muscle enzymes most commonly an elevated serum creatinine kinase, which can increase to over 50,000 in some cases. There can also be an elevation in other muscle enzymes, such as AST, ALT, and aldolase. Some patients show an elevation in just one parameter, so it is important to obtain a full panel if you have a high suspicion for disease. The EMG is another criteria. It will show spontaneous activity with fibrillation, 
complex repetitive discharge, and positive sharp waves. This is the pattern consistent with an inflammatory myopathy, and this test alone cannot differentiate between dermatomyositis, polymyositis, inclusion body myositis, or other inflammatory myopathies. Muscle biopsy is important in making a diagnosis of dermatomyositis. There are classic histopathologic signs, such as perifascicular necrosis and perivascular lymphocyte infiltrate, that differentiate dermatomyositis from other inflammatory myopathies. We will see these on the next slide. The last criterion is the presence of one of the classic skin changes we have just reviewed, such as heliotrope rash, Gautron sign or papules, shell sign or Malar rash. To meet the Bohan and Peter criteria for diagnosis of dermatomyositis, four out of five criteria gives you a definite diagnosis, three out of five is a probable diagnosis, and two out of five is a possible diagnosis of dermatomyositis. The histology seen in dermatomyositis includes perifascicular necrosis and perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. Here you can see these changes on the biopsy. Around the nerve, the muscle fibers can undergo phagocytosis and necrosis, with subsequent muscle atrophy, which can be noted on gross physical examination as weakness. Not all muscles will be affected, and there can be patches of inflammation within the muscle. Therefore, the biopsy is susceptible to sampling error. CD4-positive lymphocytes surround the walls of the blood vessels and cause narrowing and stenosis which is why it is classified as a vasculopathy and not a vasculitis. EMG or MRI can often be used to define an area involvement in target muscle biopsy to reduce sampling error. The immunology of this disease is currently under investigation. The exact pathophysiology has not been defined. There are autoantibodies which are often present, and the autoantibody profile can help determine prognosis. We will review this in a bit more detail on the next slide. We do know that there is an upregulation of MHC class 1 molecules on muscle fibers in dermatomyositis. Increase in MHC class 1 molecules increases immune system signaling. Infiltrating T cells are directly involved in myotoxicity, and B cells may have a role in immune dysregulation. Additionally, dermatomyositis is characterized by complement activation, including MAC deposition within vessels. Taken together, all of these pathologic abnormalities suggest that both the innate and humoral immunity are involved in the disease. Myositis associated in specific antibodies. There are a number of autoantibodies that are considered myositis associated antibodies, meaning they are frequently found in patients with inflammatory myopathies. These antibodies include anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double-stranded antibody, which is also seen in mixed connective disease and lupus, and anti-Rho antibodies, which are seen in a variety of autoimmune diseases, including Sjogren syndrome. There are also a number of myositis-specific antibodies. These autoantibodies include several anti-tRNA synthetase antibodies, as well as a number of other autoantibodies described in populations of patients with inflammatory myopathies. Each antisynthetase antibody is against a particular tRNA synthetase with an antihistidyl tRNA synthetase known as anti jo antibody being the most common. The antisynthetase syndrome is a clinical syndrome in which affected patients generally have inflammatory myositis, interstitial lung disease, inflammatory arthritis, mechanic sands, and Raynaud's phenomenon. Several of the antisynthetase antibodies are associated with varying prevalence of each of these manifestations, and these antibodies are useful for determining prognosis and predicting response to therapy. Individuals can have antisynthetase antibodies and features of antisynthetase syndrome along with either dermatomyositis or polymyositis. Anti-JO antibody is the most common anti-tRNA synthetase antibody, and it is associated with myositis, arthritis, Raynaud's phenomenon, and interstitial lung disease. Anti-PL6 and PL12 synthetase antibodies are associated with interstitial lung disease. Anti-SRP, or signal recognition peptide, is associated with a severe necrotizing myopathy with very high CPK levels and a rapidly progressive form of the disease. Of note, dermatomyositis can be the first sign of an underlying malignancy. 15 to 30% of adult cases are perineoplastic syndromes. 
The most common associated malignancies are ovarian, GI, lung, breast, and lymphoma. In Asian populations, nasopharyngeal cancer is common. Therefore, for the first two years after diagnosis, there should be active surveillance for malignancy in adults, including colonoscopy, pap smears, vaginal ultrasounds, chest x-rays, in consideration of a CT of a chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Also, CA-125, CA-19-9, and PSA serum measurements should be obtained. In patients under the age of 18, underlying neoplasms are rare, and routine screening for malignancy is not recommended. The morbidity to this disease is related to the weakness. Patients may be at risk for aspiration if pharyngeal muscles are affected or respiratory compromise if respiratory muscles are involved and weak. Muscle contractures can cause significant loss of function or ambulation if not treated with both systemic therapy and physical and occupational therapy. The calcinosis can be a severe and debilitating complication. The involvement can range from a few mild nodules to significant nodules around joints causing pain and limitation of range of motion and ambulation. In rare cases, a sheet-like exoskeleton can develop, causing loss of ambulation and respiratory compromise. There are no FDA-approved medications for the treatment of dermatomyositis. Immunosuppressant medication is commonly used. The cornerstone of treatment is high-dose steroids given through the IV and or orally. There is trial-based evidence to support the use of intravenous immunoglobulin, or IVIG, for treatment of dermatomyositis. Additionally, there is published literature supporting the use of methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and mycophenolate mofetil. There are also case reports of successful treatment with rituximab and abatacept in recalcitrant cases. In summary, dermatomyositis is a rare autoimmune inflammatory myopathy. It can occur in all ages. The diagnosis is made based on a constellation of clinical findings such as skin lesions, muscle weakness, and myositis, EMG changes, elevated muscle enzymes, and classic changes on muscle biopsy. It is a disease in which the skin and muscle are primarily affected. The proximal muscles are the first to be targeted. In adult patients, an underlying malignancy must be considered and surveyed for. This is just a reiteration of the key points. And here are a list of references used in developing this talk. I would like to thank Dr. Lisa Criscione Schreiber for a thoughtful review of this case and Duke University Medical Center. Thank you.